Hi guys and welcome to another episode of the Strong Guy Storytime with me, the Strong Guy. Good evening guys and welcome to episode 4 of my Norse Mythology series. In this episode I'm going to be reading The Treasures of the Gods. Hope you enjoy it. Let's get to it. <clears throat> the Treasures of the Gods Thor's wife was a beautiful Sif. She was of the Aesir. For loved her for herself, and for her blue eyes, and her pale skin, her red lips, and her smile. He loved her long, long hair, the colour of a field of barley, at the end of summer. Thor woke and stared at sleeping Sif. He scratched his beard, then he tapped his wife with a huge hand. What happened to you? he asked. She opened her eyes, the colour of the summer sky. What are you talking about? she asked. And then she moved her head and looked puzzled. Her, he her fingers reached up to her bare pink scalp touched it. Exploring it tentatively, he looked at Thor horrified. My hair, was all she said. Thor nodded. It's gone, he said. He has left you bald. He? asked Sif. Thor said nothing. He strapped on his belt of power, Medingord, which doubled his enormous strength. Loki, he said. Loki has done this. Why would you say that? said Sif, touching her bald head frantically, as if the fluttering touch of her fingers Make her hair return. Because, said Thor, when something goes wrong, the first thing I always think is it is Loki's fault. It saves a lot of time. Thor found Loki's door locked, so he pushed through it, leaving it in pieces. He picked Loki up and said only, Why? Why what? Loki's face was a picture of perfect innocence. Sif's hair, my wife's golden hair, it was so beautiful. Why did you cut it off? A hundred expressions chased each other across Loki's face. Cunning and shiftiness, truculence and confusion. Thor shook Loki hard. Loki looked down and did his best to appear ashamed. It was funny, and I was drunk. Thor's brow lowered. Sif's hair was her glory. People think that her head was shaved for punishment. That she did something she'd not have done. Did it with someone she'd not have done it with. Oh well, yes, there is that said Loki. They will probably think that. And unfortunately, given that I sh took her hair from the roots, she'll go through the rest of her life completely bald. No, she won't. Thor looked up at Loki, whom he was now holding far above his head, with a face like thunder. I'm afraid she will. They're always hats and scarves. She won't go through the life bald, said Thor. Because Loki, loud face son, if you don't put hair back on her, Right now, I'm going to break every single bone in your body. Each and every one of them. And if her hair does not grow properly, I will come back and break every bone in her, your body again and again. I'll do it every day. I will soon get really good at it. He carried on. I sounded only slightly more cheerful. No, said Loki. I can't put her hair back. It doesn't work like that. Today, news for. It will probably take me about an hour to break every bone in your body. But I bet that with practice... I get down to about 15 minutes. It'll be interesting to find out. He started to break his first bone. Dwarves! shrieked Loki. Pardon? Dwarves! They can make anything. They could make golden hair for Sif, hair that would bond with her scalp, and grow normally. Perfect golden hair. They could do it. I swear they could. Then, said Thor, you had better go and talk to them. And he dropped Loki from high above his head onto the floor. Loki clambered to his feet and hurried away before Thor could break any more bones. He put on his shoes that let him travel through the sky and he went to Swathenheim, where the dwarves had their workshops. The most ingenious craftsman of them all, he decided, were the three dwarves known as the Sons of Ivaldi. Loki went to their underground forge. Hello, Sons of Ivaldi. I've asked around and people here tell me that Brock and Eitri, his brother, are the greatest dwarf craftsmen there are or ever been, said Loki. No said one of the sons of Ivaldi. It's us. We are the greater craftsmen there are. I am sure that Brock and Entry can make treasures as good as those you can. Lies, said the toys of the sons of Ivaldi. I wouldn't trust those fumble-fingered incompetence to shoe a horse. The smallest and wise of the sons of Ivaldi simply shrugged. Whatever they make, we could do better. I hear that they've challenged you, said Loki. Three treasures. The gods of the Aesir will judge who made the best treasure. Oh, and by the way, one of the treasures you make needs to be hair. Ever-growing perfect golden hair. We can do that, said one of the sons of Ivaldi. 
Even Loki could barely tell them apart. Loki went across the mountain to see the dwarf called Brock. The workshop he shared with his brother Eitri. He vowed his sons are making free treasures as gifts for the gods of Asgard, said Loki. The gods are going to judge them. He vowed his sons want me to tell you that they are certain you and your brother Eitri can't make anything as good as they can. They called you fumble-fingered incompetence. Brock was no fool. This noise is only fishy to me, Loki said. Loki, he said. Are you sure this isn't your doing? Stirring up trouble between Eitri and me and the Valdis boys. It's not the sort of thing you'd do. Loki looked as godless as he could, which was amazingly godless. Nothing to do with me, he said innocently. I just thought you ought to know. And you have no personal stake in this, asked Brock. None whatsoever. Brock nodded and looked up at Loki. Brock's brother Eitri was the greatest craftsman, but Brock was the smarter of the two and more determined. Well then, We'll be happy to make take on the sons of Ivaldi in a test of skill, to be judged by the gods, because I have no doubt that Eitri can forge better and crafty things than Ivaldi's lot. Let's make this personal, Loki, eh? What do you have in mind? asked Loki. Your head, said Brock. If we win this contest, we get your head, Loki. There's lots of things inside, inside the head of yours. I have no doubt that Eitri could make a wonderful device out of it. A thinking machine, perhaps, or an inkwell. Loki kept smiling, but he scowled on the inside. They had sighted so well. Still, he simply had to ensure that Eitri and Brock lost the contest. The gods would still get six wonderful things from the dwarves, and Sif would get her golden hair. He could do that. He was Loki. Of course, he said. My head, no problem. Across the mountain, the sons of Ivaldi were making their treasures. Loki was not worried about them, but he needed to make sure that Brock and Eitri did not could not possibly win. Brock and Eitri entered the forge. It was dark in there, lit by the orange glow of burning charcoal. Eitri took a pigskin from a shelf and placed it into the forge. I've been keeping this pigskin for something like this, he said. Brock just nodded. Right, said Eitri. You work the bellows, Brock. Just keep pumping them. I need this hot, and I need it consistently hot. Otherwise it won't work. Pump, pump. Brock began to pump the bellows sending a stream of oxygen-rich air into the heart of the forge, heating everything up. He had done it many times before. Eitri watched until he was satisfied that it would be all to his liking. Eitri left to work on his creation outside the forge. As he opened the door to go out, a large black insect flew in. It was not a horsefly, it was not a deerfly. It was bigger than either. It flew in and circled the room in a malicious way. Brock could hear the sound of Eitri's hammers outside the forge, and the sounds of filing and twisting. Shaping and banging. The large black fly, it was the biggest blackest fly he'd ever seen, lay on the back of Brock's hand. Both of Brock's hands were on the bellows. He did not stop pumping to swat at the fly. The fly bit Brock hard on the back of the hand. Brock kept pumping. The door opened, and each came in and carefully pulled the work from the forge. It appeared to be a huge boar, with bristles of gleaming gold. Good work, said Eitri. A fraction of a degree warmer or cooler, and the whole thing would have been a waste of time. Good work, you too, said Brock. The black flyer up on the corner of the ceiling seethed with resentment and irritation. Eitri took a block of gold and placed it in the forge. Right, he said, this next one will impress them. When I call, start pumping the bellows, and whatever happens, do not slow down or speed up or stop. There's fiddly work involved. Got it, said Brock. Eitri left the room and began to work. Brock waited until he heard Eitri's call and decided to pump the bellows. The black flyer circled the room thoughtfully. Then landed on Brock's neck. The insect stepped inside dainty, aside daintily to avoid a rivulet of sweat. For the air was hot and close in the forge. It bit Brock's neck as hard as it could. Scarlet blood now joined the sweat on Brock's neck. But the dwarf did not stop pumping. Each returned, he removed the white hot arm ring from the forge. He dropped it into the stone cooling pool in the forge to quench it. There was a cloud of steam as the arm ring fell into the water. The ring cooled moving rapidly from orange to red hot and then as it called to gold. It's called Dropnir, said Eitri. The Dripper? That's my name for a ring, said Brock. Not for this one, said Eitri, and he explained to Brock that was so special about the arm ring. Now, said Eitri, there's something I've had in mind to make for a very long time now. My masterwork is even trickier than the other two. So whatever you have to do is Pump, and don't stop pumping, said Brock. That's right, said Eitri. 
even more than before. Do not change your pace, or the whole thing will be ruined. Idri pulled up an ingot of pig iron, bigger than any ingot that the black fly, who was Loki, had ever seen before, and he hefted it into the forge. He left the room and called out to Brock to begin pumping. Brock began to pump, and the sound of Idri's hammers began as Idri pulled and shaped and welded and joined. Loki and fly shape decided that there was no time for subtlety. Idri's masterpiece would be something that would impress the gods. If the gods were impressed enough, then he would lose his head. Loki landed between Brock's eyes and started to bite the dwarf's eyelids. The dwarf continued to pump his eyes, stinging. Loki bit deeper, harder, more desperately. Now blood ran from the dwarf's eyelids into his eyes and down his face, blinding him. Brock squinted and shook his head, trying to dislodge the fly. He jogged his head from side to side. He contorted his mouth and tried blowing air up into the, up the fly. It was no good. The fly continued to bite, and the dwarf could see nothing but blood. A sharp pain filled his head. Brock counted. At the bottom of the downstroke, he whipped one hand from the bellows and swiped at the fly with such speed and such strength that Loki barely escaped his life. Brock grabbed the bellows once again and continued to pump. Enough! called Eatry. The black fly flew unsteadily about the room. Eatry opened the door, allowing the fly to escape. Eatry looked at his brother with disappointment. Brock's face was a mess of blood and sweat. I don't know what you were playing at that time, said Eatry, but you came close to ruining everything. The temperature was all over the place at the end. As it is, it's nowhere near as impressive as I'd hoped, which we'll have to see. Loki, in Loki shape, strolled in through the open door. So, all ready for the contest? he asked. Brock can go to Asgard and present my gifts to the gods, and cut off your head, said Eatry. I like it best here at my forge, making things. Brock stared at Loki through swollen eyelids. I'm looking forward to cutting off your head, said Brock. It got personal. In Asgard, three gods sat on their thrones, one-eyed Odin, the Allfather, red-bearded Thor of the Thunders, and handsome Frey of the Summer's Harvest. They would be the judges. Loki stood before them, beside the three almost identical sons of the Audi. Brock, black-bearded and brooding, was there alone, standing to one side. The things he had brought hidden beneath sheets. So, said Odin, what are we judging? Treasures, said Loki. The sons of the Audi have made gifts for you, great Odin, and for Thor, and for Frey. And so have Idri and Brock. It is up to you to decide which of the six things is the finest treasure. I myself... We'll show you the gifts made by the sons of Ivaldi. He presented Odin with a spear called Gungnir. It was a beautiful spear, carved with intricate runes. It will penetrate anything, and when you throw it, you will always find its mark, said Loki. Odin had one eye, after all, and sometimes his aim could be less than perfect. And just as important, an oath taken in this ring, spear, is unbreakable. Odin hefted the spear. It is very fine, was all he said. And here said Loki proudly. It's a flowing head of golden hair, made of real gold. You will attach yourself to the head of the person who needs it and grow and behave in every way as if it were real hair. A hundred thousand strands of gold. I will test it, said Thor. Sif, come here. Sif rose and came to the front, her head covered. She removed her headscarf. The gods gasped, and they saw Sif's naked head, bald and pink. And then she carefully placed the dwarf's golden wig on her head, shook her hair. They watched as the base of the wig drawn itself to her scalp, and then Sif stood in front of them, even more radiant and beautiful than before. Impressive, said Thor. Good job. Sif tossed her golden hair and walked out of the hall, into the sunlight, to show her new hair to her friends. The last of the sons of Valdi's remarkable gifts was small and folded like cloth. This cloth Loki placed in front of Frey. What is it? It looks like a silk scarf, said Frey, unimpressed. It does, said Loki. But if you unfold it, it will discover it is a ship called Skidbladir. It will always have a fire wind wherever it goes, and although it is huge, the biggest ship you can imagine, it will fold up as you see, like a cloth, so you can put it into your pouch. Frey was impressed, and Loki was relieved. They were three excellent gifts. Now it was Brock's turn. His eyes were red and swollen, and there was a huge insect bite on the side of his neck. Loki thought Brock looked entirely cocky, too cocky especially, given the remarkable things Ivaldi's sons had made. Brock took the golden armoring and placed it in front of Odin, his high throne. 
This arm ring is called Dropnir, said Brock, because every ninth night, eight gold arm rings of equal beauty will drip from it. You can reward people with them or store them, and your wealth will increase. Odin examined the arm ring, then pushed it onto his arm, up high to his bicep. It gleamed there. It was very fine, he said. Loki recalled that Odin had said the same thing about the spear. Brock walked over to Frey. He raised a cloth and drew a huge boar with bristles made of gold. This is the boar my brother made for you. To pull your chariot, said Brock. It will race across the sky and over the sea, faster than the fastest horse. There will never be a night so dark that his golden bristles will not give light, as you see what you are doing. It will never tire and will never fail you. It is called Gullimbursty, the golden bristled one. Frey looked impressed, still thought Loki, the magical ship that folded like a cloth, was every bit as impressive as an unstoppable war that shone in the dark. Loki's head was quite safe, and the glass gift Brock had to present was the one that Loki knew he had already managed to sabotage. From beneath the cloth, Brock produced a hammer and placed it in front of Thor. Thor looked at it and sniffed. The hand was rather short, he said. Brock nodded. Yes, he said. That's my fault. I was working the bellows, but before you dismiss it, let me tell you about what makes the hammer unique. It's called Molnir, the lightning maker. First of all, it's unbreakable. Doesn't matter how hard you hit something with it, the hammer will always be undamaged. Thor looked interested. He'd already broken a great many weapons over the years, normally by hitting things with them. If you throw the hammer, it will never miss what you throw it at. Thor looked even more impressed. He had lost a number of otherwise excellent weapons by throwing them and things that irritated him and missing. He had to watch too many weapons he had thrown disappear into the distance, never to be seen again. No matter how hard you or how far you throw it, it will always return to your hand. Thor was now actually smiling, and the Thunder God did not smile often. You can change the size of the hammer, it will grow, it will also shrink down so small that if you wish, you could hide it in your inside your shirt. Thor clapped his hands together in delight and thunder echoed across Asgard. And yet, as you have observed, concluded Brock, sadly the handle of the hammer is indeed too short. This is my fault. I failed to keep the bellows blowing while my brother Edry was forging it. The shortness of the handle is a minor cosmetic problem, said Thor. This hammer will protect us from the frost giants. This is the finest gift I've ever seen. It will protect Asgard, it will protect all of us, said Odin with approval. If I were a giant, I would be very afraid of Thor if you had that hammer said Frey. Yes, it's an excellent hammer. But Thor, what about the hair? It's this beautiful new golden hair? asked Loki slightly desperately. What? Oh yes, my wife has very nice hair, said Thor. Now show me how to make the hammer grow and shrink. Brock, Thor's hammer is better even than my wonderful spear, and my excellent arm ring, said Odin, nodding. The hammer is greater and more impressive than my ship and my boar, admitted Frey. It will keep the gods of Asgard safe. The gods clapped Brock on the back and told him that he and Edry had made the finest gifts that they had ever seen. Good to know, said Brock. He turned to Loki. So, said Brock, I get to cut off your head. Laugh, eh, son? I'll take it back with me. Edry will be so pleased. We can turn into something useful. I will ransom my head, said Loki. I have treasures I can give you. Edry and I already have all the treasure we need, said Brock. We make treasure. No, Loki, I want your head. Loki thought for a moment and said, Then you can have it if you can catch me. And Loki leapt high into the air and ran off, far above their heads. In moments he was gone. Brock looked at Thor. Can you catch him? Thor shrugged. I really shouldn't, he said, but then I would very much like to try out the hammer. In moments Thor returned holding Loki tightly. Loki was glaring at with impotent fury. The dwarf, Brock, took out his knife. Come here, Loki, he said. I'm going to cut off your head. Of course, said Loki, you can of course cut off my head, but, and I appeal to mighty Odin here, if you cut off any of my neck, you are violating the terms of our agreement, which promised you my head, and my head only. Odin inclined his head. Loki is right, he said. You have no right to cut his neck. Brock was irritated, but I can't cut off his head without cutting off his neck, he said. Loki looked pleased with himself. You see, he said. If people thought through the exactness of their words, they would not dare to take on Loki, the wisest, the cleverest, the trickiest, the most intelligent, the best looking. Brock whispered a suggestion to Odin. That would be fair. That would be fair. Odin agreed. 
Brock produced a strip of leather and a knife. He wrapped the leather around Loki's mouth. Brock tried to pierce the leather with the tip of a knife blade. It's not working, said Brock. The knife isn't cutting you. I might have wisely arranged for protection from knife blades, said Loki modestly, just in case the whole you can't cut my neck ploy did not work. I'm afraid no knife blade can cut me. Brock grunted and produced an awl, a pointed spike used in leather work, and he jabbed it through the leather, punching holes through it. Loki's lips, then he took a strong thread, and he sewed Loki's lips together with it. Brock walked away, leaving Loki with his mouth sewn up tight, unable to complain. For Loki, the pain of being unable to walk hurt even more than the pain of having his lips stitched into the leather. So now you know, this is how the gods got their greatest treasures. It was Loki's fault. Even Thor's hammer was Loki's fault. That was the thing about Loki. You resented him even when you were at your most grateful. And you were grateful to him even when you hated him the most. Well, there you have it. Lost Treasure of the Gods from Norse Mythology. I hope you enjoyed it. Apologies for my pronunciation of some of the words. And there was a couple of mistakes in there. But it's a long story. I didn't want to have to do it again. It's late at night. So apologies for that. But I um, hope you enjoy it. And thanks for watching. See you next time for episode 5.